seems like such a simple thing, organizing a music library, but I've really found that a lot of different people have a lot of different ideas on this matter. And I wanted to discuss with you the way that I organize my music library in our orchestra program and why it's worked so successfully. As you can see, we don't have a huge space in here. So in our case, we had to be really efficient in terms of how we utilize our storage. In my experience, Wanger has been a fantastic option. This is the Wanger library system. You simply pull on this, it comes out. We don't have carpet on the floor. Sometimes that can get complicated with carpet. It makes it harder to pull out, but it works that easily. And you can see that we have boxes from JW Pepper's website that we purchase. And we organize our music library using a simple Sharpie and their box system. I purchase all of my blank boxes from JW Pepper. JW Pepper is fantastic and they have a really good file finder music library system, as you can see right here. I usually by default purchase the 60-3 option, which you can see right here under instrumental music. It is 60-3 and it is a nine by 12 and it has a one and one half inch depth for the music. Generally speaking, this is gonna fit most of the standard size music. Works really, really well. And then I simply write the title, composer arranger information, and the number that I add to the library right on this side of the box. I don't really use this portion of the box at all. I just keep it simple and put it on that end right down there and the rest goes in a spreadsheet. I should also add that there are different size options for the boxes, of course. Um, you can see we have some smaller ones here in our library. I generally like the one and a half inch size box though. Keeps things looking uniform, but if you're looking to save space, you could certainly get the smaller boxes as well that they offer. I essentially have two different portions to my library. I have a standard size, which is right here, which I just showed you. And then I also have an oversized set of boxes, which is right in here. Now, obviously some music is larger and it will not fit in the standard size boxes, the one and a half, the 60 dash three that I just showed from JW Pepper. So I use these oversized boxes and then some are even larger yet and will actually manually cut those boxes if it's an oversized score. For instance, when you're trying to fit a very large score like this, uh, sometimes we have to do a little bit of surgery on these boxes in order to make it all fit into the library. So we also have some super oversized boxes as well, but we call this portion of the library OV for oversized. For the oversized portion of our music library, we use specifically Gamble music boxes. And you can see they look like this when they're sent to you and shipped to you, but the Gamble Music Boxes, based out of Chicago, this is specifically the CT04 box. I really, really love this particular box. Um, and as you can see, if you look down there in the code, there's the different options that they offer for band and orchestra music and choral music above. But the CT04 is one and a half inch depth, and it's a 12 by 15 and a half inch box. It's the largest box that they offer specifically for oversized music. And this works really well. It's generally speaking going to fit all of your oversized scores. Things are going to fit very nicely when it doesn't fit in that traditional size box when it's just a little bit too large. And as you can see, I write on the side of this box, we stack them vertically like this because obviously they wouldn't fit depth wise. It would be too deep for this particular cabinet that we have from Wenger. So stacking them this way works really well and very efficiently. You ever have scores like this that are absolutely huge and they won't even fit in like an oversized box like this? Well, in this case, I have a very special approach that I utilize and a special tactic. And what I do is I will essentially do perform surgery on this CT04 box to make it even larger. And I'll sacrifice a second box and I will cut off this template that I've made. I cut off the top like this, and then I cut it long ways across like this, and then I will attach it to the top of one of these boxes by removing the little flaps at the top first and then extending it, and I have a standard height that I've sort of set it to, as you can see right there, and with the dimensions right there on my box, if you can read my poor penmanship. And then I just attach it to the top, in order to make this box even larger. So if you have a really enormous score, which sometimes we do in the orchestral and band world, then it fits very nicely into these enormous boxes. You just have to get a little creative in making it all fit. 
One thing I do recommend doing on the oversized boxes and really all of the boxes for their integrity is to add a little clear packing tape on the bottom. Helps to keep these very large boxes together, ensuring that it won't break on you. As you can tell here, I have an auxiliary filing cabinet, which specifically holds our solo and ensemble-like materials or some method books specifically. Say I want a Suzuki base book. Well, here we go. Here are Suzuki base books. Uh, if I specifically want to go to a Star Wars book here, well, I've got a Star Wars book that's listed, which is really handy, Disney greats, etc. And I've got this all in the spreadsheet, which makes it really easy to be able to find what we have, studies, etc. What about when your students are actively playing music? Where are you going to put the pieces of music? In the front of the classroom? Just randomly in strange places? How about not? Instead, where I have them, I've had these two towers, and you can buy these just about anywhere. You can get office supply type materials. But I put the box back on my music library that it's stored in, and I take the set of parts out, and I'll put my photocopies in here as well, and I simply put it all inside here, and I'll label it with a label. Right now, I don't have too many labels, but here's my fundamentals packet. You would open that, easily be able to find it. And I have it organized typically by ensemble, and I use just a traditional label maker to place that on there, and it helps me save a whole lot of time, helps to keep things much more organized. Also, when music needs to be filed, we put it right in there. Right now, there's a bad dad joke book, but I love that book. Um, gotta love dad jokes. And again, the music to be filed goes right there in that box, which is extremely handy. Then when I have time, I'll simply go back in and I'll file whatever music needs to be filed. Easy peasy, easy to do it. Another little thing that you could do is I mark the actual number from our music library on. So when this is maybe outside of the library itself, I know instantly what box it goes into. I can go to my catalog and I can go, oh yeah, okay, 275, boom, it goes right in there. It saves you some time and some people even have a stamp that they'll put on the parts and the set, which saves a little bit of time as well, helps to keep things organized. If you have pieces that won't quite fit all the way in one box, say you have multiple copies of it, I just put them just right back to back. And say you have, if you have string and wind parts or percussion and brass, you know, and you want to break it up, you could even do it that way too and it'd save a little bit of time. But I just put them right back to back. So you can see here, this is the digital version of our music library. I keep all of the information about our library in a spreadsheet. Now this is a Google Sheet, which is really handy for sharing, but you could also do this in a OneDrive. You could do it a lot of different ways, and an old school spreadsheet certainly works just fine as well. But I'm able to share this with my colleagues. And so say you have different people in different buildings, you can share that spreadsheet. You can see it, you can add to it. Everyone has access to that document. We know what's stored in which building. Now this is specifically just a high school spreadsheet and I have one for our middle school as well because sometimes we need to borrow music from that library. Sometimes they need to borrow music from our library. Saves money and it's quicker that way when we can when we can simply use what we already have. But what's great about this, as you can see, I just add a new number to our music library. As you can see on the left side here, every time that we buy a new piece. Now, I know some people who alphabetize their music library, and that seems like a lot of work to me. Um, say you get a piece that starts with the letter A, well, then you've got to go in, you've got to shift your entire music library and go through a whole lot of effort to completely redo things. Whereas with this, you can alphabetize the spreadsheet anytime. You can even keep a paper printed version of, this, of the spreadsheet alphabetized in your music library to be able to check when you need to access something quickly. But the spreadsheet is the ultimate flexibility. And you can see here on my spreadsheet that I have our library listed. I have the number that it is. That's the catalog number in our library. This is our traditional size right here. Um, and you can see I also have oversized right down here. So for the oversized portion of the library, the OV, I have that listed right there as well in a separate tab. And then we have an auxiliary like solo and ensemble like portion to our music library that lives in a filing cabinet. Back to the traditional size, I have the number of each piece and I just, every time we get a new piece, I add it to the end. I don't add it to the very beginning or re-alphabetize the entire physical library itself. We can always, we can always sort a spreadsheet easily. The title is listed right here. So I just 
enter that. We have the composer first and last names, arranger's names if applicable, FO or SO in this case. FO is full orchestra, SO is string orchestra. So if I want to quickly look at what are my full orchestra options, I can do that. And you can sort the spreadsheet that way. I also have the grade level of each piece. And sometimes you have to make an approximation, but with one being kind of beginner music and six being, all right, this is professional literature. This is a Shostakovich symphony, for example. Um, I, I would list it that way. And then I have the type as well. So if it's just a traditional concert piece, then that's fine. If it's a holiday piece, I can list holiday uh, or pop, or Halloween, etc. You really have a lot of flexibility there and you can easily sort if you're going, man, I need something that's full orchestra. Uh, you can and you that is a Halloween piece, then you can sort that really easily and quickly. I also will list when it was last played. I'm not always great about putting that back in the spreadsheet. I need to be better about that. It uh, helps you to keep track of when things are played, but I keep that all in a note on my iPhone to keep track of it. Also, I have our Indiana State School Music Association, what the required number is. So I, I'll know, oh, that's a piece that's on the required list. And I can instantly go to that piece and I can again sort the spreadsheet easily when I'm looking for a required number. Also have the same th corresponding information for middle school. And then I even have a link as well that you can click on and you can access the audio link to listen to it quickly, which saves a lot of time in the end. Obviously, there are a lot of different ways to ultimately organize a music library, but I find this is the easiest. And just keep in mind, there's no real wrong way. You just want to be able to find it quickly, simply, easily, and have it so you can perpetually add to the library without making it difficult for yourself. So all the best to you. Hope this helps.